we haven't had a chance to talk uh, about Kobe Bryant yet. Oh, yeah. Because I know yesterday you were coming back from <sighs> Los Angeles and we didn't have a show. Um, you were at the Grammys where, um, it was at the Staples Center, right? Absolutely. Which is where the Lakers played and where all the mourners were showing up yesterday mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. That's right. That's what, right. Was, what was the experience like? Tell me about the people's reaction out there and, and, and about what you felt there in the room. Well, that morning I was in Calabasas, um, as fate would have it. And I was, you know, it, it reminds you of how much of this life is, is just a vapor. We're here and, and um, even the mighty among us, those who seem like they'll live forever, the immortal ones can just be gone, just like that. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, with all the greatness that he left in the world, it seemed like he had so much more to go and all the people who were on the plane, on the helicopter and, and his, his daughter who had so much promise, it just kind of all hit us at one time. Mm -hmm. And um, it was kind of hard to celebrate at the Grammys, to be honest. Everybody was in a very mournful, reflective mood, even amongst the great celebration. It just felt, mm -hmm. it, it felt as if we lost something very important and had been reminded collectively of, of something also very important that we all have to face. Did you ever get a chance to meet him? I did. I, when I was, uh, I was a young baller at one time, and I got the honor of playing at the NBA All-Star Game in 2008. And um, I was on half court, and I was getting ready to play the piano and the sound check. And Kobe, all the players walk on, but Kobe was, I mean, 08. You know, this is prime, prime Kobe. And I, I remember just looking at him, he was a giant to me. I'd never seen him in person. He was so tall, and he just comes over, and he's so warm to me, and everybody that was performing, and just felt like he, um, he was just as great a person, um, as personable as he was great on the basketball court. So I remember that moment vividly. And of course, followed him since then and followed him um, as he continued to break records and win championships. Um, well, I, I never got a chance to meet him. Um, but I, I do feel a strange connection in this moment, um, one that I wouldn't wish on anybody, but I feel a strange connection to his family and his friends and those who loved him and those who've gone through this particular tragedy, including not only the family and friends of Kobe Bryant and Gianna Bryant, but also the family of John Altobelli, Carrie Altobelli, Elisa Altobelli, Sarah Chester, Peyton Chester, Christina Mauser, and Ara Zobayan. Because I lost my father and two of my brothers when I was a boy to a plane crash that was also in heavy fog. And one of the terrible things about that shock and the, the heartbreaking unreality, nightmare quality of someone huge in your life who just disappears, the center of, of your love disappearing in that moment, is not knowing what happened. Now, the... The strange thing about helicopter flight that I learned from a woman named Choppy Patterson. This is Choppy. She was our pilot down in New Zealand. And after we flew with each other um, for two days, um, Choppy asked to talk to me after my last flight. And she, she gave me something on the flight, and she gave me this as a Punamu Jade whistle. And I wasn't sure why she gave me this whistle. Um, which I love and, and, and I think of her when I have it. But she gave it to me because we had a connection. Like me, she lost her father in a plane crash when she was 10 years old. And she lost her son in a helicopter crash. And she wanted me to know that unlike a plane, helicopters don't have black boxes. And when a helicopter goes down, we don't necessarily know why it did. It has to be investigated only at the crash site. Now, in the crash that killed my father and my brothers, which was flight 212, Eastern Airlines, on September 11th, 1974, um, we had a flight recorder. And because investigators knew what happened in that cockpit, new rules were created to save other people's lives. It's called the sterile cockpit rule. So flight safety could be improved. 
And I think it's crazy that helicopters don't have black box recorders. Because as Choppy explained to me, when a helicopter goes down, we don't know how to improve the helicopter. We don't know how to, we don't know how to improve the flying of the pilots so this won't happen again in the future. And I hope that while nothing will possibly improve this tragedy, while nothing will take away this heart ache and this pain from this family that will be living with it for the rest of their lives and all these people's families who will be living with a heartbreak and in the need of love and support for the rest of their lives, for a pain that will never go away, that perhaps someone could take action to make sure that there are some ways to record what is happening in these helicopters so that it doesn't happen as often. Choppy has one. She has a nonprofit that created one called Eye in the Sky. That might be a good answer. There might be another one out there. But to do nothing after helicopters go down like this and we lose greats like this, or we lose any person whose family is now in agony and in ignorance of what happened to their loved one, I think is unconscionable. So I hope the NTSB will do something to improve the conditions for helicopter pilots and the information they can get if a tragedy like this happens. Because these people are now in misery. Why compound their misery with mystery about what happened to their loved ones? It's better to know than not to know. Because if we know, we could possibly stop this from happening to someone else in the future. And personally, I want to send my love and my prayers to Kobe's family and to all these families and know that there is something on the other side of this grief. We'll be right back.